Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Deserts, the driest places on Earth, covering more than a fifth of all the world's landmass, as dangerous to life as the highest peak or the coldest glacier. But in these harsh and barren wastelands, nature endures. People have lived in the desert since the beginning of time. Resilient and resourceful, they have developed unique cultures and deep spiritual bonds with these arid lands. But the modern world of commerce and industry is encroaching on the desert, claiming its resources, changing the delicate balance of life. Now, more than ever, desert people must adapt to survive. This series tells their story of struggle and endeavor, of humanity's continuing relationship with the most challenging places on Earth. A vast ocean of ancient sand that's been here for 80 million years. Its name means wide open space. Stretching over 2,000 kilometers along the western coast of Namibia, lapped by the cool waters of the Atlantic. The Namib lies within the boundaries of Africa's largest national park. Over 10,000 million hectares of protected wilderness. Here there are many jewels to be found. Some of the world's highest sand dunes. Magnificent desert creatures. And some of the most majestic tribes in Africa. But today, it's not just the wilderness that needs protection. The Namib is in the grip of an HIV pandemic. It's estimated that within the next 10 years, one in four of Namibia's children will be orphaned to AIDS. More than ever before, the people of the desert must act quickly to protect themselves and to preserve all that is beautiful in the Namib. On the eastern edges of the desert lies Vinduk, Namibia's capital city. Here, brothers Bertus and Henk Schumann run a business offering exclusive aerial safaris. Edward Bolin, a very nice shipwreck actually. It started there in 1909 and it is one kilometer inland. So, so it's a family business, founded over 40 years ago by their father, Lo. Thank you. My father was um, one of the first to be crazy enough to bring people out here. Other people couldn't understand it. What is there to see out here? A beautiful desert if you know what to look for. Lo also knew where to look. By land and by plane, he explored parts of the desert few people had seen before and realized it was worth protecting. In between running tourists in and out of the wilderness, he became a leading conservationist and campaigner in the effort to establish Namibia's first national park. To 
Today, Henk and Bertus fly their customers over the very territories their father worked so tirelessly to protect. For the lucky few, it's the trip of a lifetime. Places on Earth that stir the soul as profoundly as the Namib Desert. It is so arid here, some years it never rains. The coastal dunes are almost entirely barren, and the beaches pockmarked only by the relics of ships that have run aground on the desert's aptly named Skeleton Coast. Bertus touches down in the middle of a secret wildlife paradise. And at last, his guest experiences what she's flown so far to see. Magnificent creatures roaming free in a habitat untouched by human hand. sand dunes at the family run lodge there's work to do there's now one two three four tables another one place yeah so make nine people a whole army of locals is preparing the overnight accommodation for the imminent arrival of safari guests in charge of operations is old timer and tribal chief daniel <laughs> As well as managing the staff, it's Daniel's job to meet and greet the new arrivals. But to Bertus and Henk, he's more than just a PR man. Out here, no one is ever without a father. If your father die, you get adopted by another father. So when my father died 20 years ago, they all came to the funeral, and then we were told that Daniel is our new father. So we need to look after him. Daniel's involvement also gives the brothers an edge in business. And you can make things happen. When people talk to you, it's with respect because my father is the headman of the Himba tribe here. For these guests, it's the end of a long and exciting day in the Namib. But tomorrow, the desert promises even bigger thrills. Dynamic and ever-shifting, the dunes of the Namib are a rippling sea of sand. Adventure tourists can get the ride of their lives here. It's as dangerous as it looks. The slip face of the dune is so steep, vehicles have been known to snap in two. But Henk and Bertus tackle each one as if surfing a giant wave. You made it. You actually made it. No wonder word of mouth is driving the brothers' business forward. From small villages to seaside towns, Tourism is a growth industry in Namibia, and everyone is looking to get in on the act. 
Locals are looking to carve out a piece of the tourist dollar for themselves. Even Namibia's oldest communities are moving with the times. In the far north of the Namib, near the village of Puros, lies a remote tribal homestead. It shelters an extended family, three men, 11 women, and 10 children. The whole community are members of the Himba tribe. For countless generations, the Himba have lived and thrived in this desert. Baharara is a wife and mother of eight, and she prepares a family breakfast of maize porridge for everyone. Today, the younger men of the tribe are away searching for pastures and water for their livestock. The village chief has left his elder brother, Venemeho, in charge. His only task is to stoke the sacred fire and from time to time commune with the tribal ancestors. Meanwhile, the women are in charge of domestics. They've no electricity or running water, and it's a long hike for the essentials. These days, there are easier ways to make a living. The Himba have joined the tourist trade. The women weave and carve traditional gifts for which the visitors will pay good money. To cash in, the villagers have turned their homestead into a living museum. Today, word is out that a small group of tourists is on its way. In preparation, the women get cracking on an elaborate hair and makeup routine. First, they crush a fragrant bark, which is burnt like incense inside their hut. The women drape themselves over the smoking pot, a waterless cleansing ritual, the Himba equivalent of a bath. <laughs> then a paste of ash, ochre and butterfat called otsire is applied to add luster to their flesh tones. Not only does it moisturize the skin, it's a natural sunblock. The rich red represents the color of earth and of blood. For the Himba, it symbolizes life itself. The ochre also locks in the sweet, smoky perfume of the incense bath. Hairdos are just as important, with intricate headdresses modeled to symbolize the horns of their cattle. Finally, the tourists arrive. It's showtime. Dancing is an integral part of Himba life. There are dances that summon rain, dances for healing, and even some that can put you in a trance. Today's dance is just for fun. For the tourists, it's an experience that they simply couldn't buy anywhere else. But it's not just about hand-to-mouth survival. 
A priority is saving money to send the children to school, giving the next generation wider life choices. Compared to their visitors, the women are very aware of their own lack of education. Self-respect is something these desert people treasure. Tourism gives them the chance to build a future for their children on their own terms. But there's one thing in which the Himba can't be entirely self-sufficient. Healthcare. Once a year, an international charity drives the young and weak of the village to a mobile clinic. It's their one and only annual health check. <laughs> The younger, fitter villagers have to get there under their own steam. One of the volunteer doctors at the clinic is Namibian neurologist, Dr. Vaya Vashiwa. He knows that in these remote areas, basic healthcare can save lives. We tend to encounter a lot of issues in the children part, Related to nutrition, the kids are usually quite small. Okay, it's probably got to do with uh, how much nutrition they receive at an early age. But poor nutrition is not the biggest threat. Even in the heart of the desert, HIV AIDS is having a devastating effect. As many as one in three people in Namibia are infected with the HIV virus. Himba customs have made them particularly vulnerable. In these traditional communities, sexual activity starts early, and polygamy is the norm. For almost two decades, HIV AIDS has been the leading cause of death nationwide. It's a catastrophe that strikes at the heart of desert life. The remote village of Osikandero is made up almost entirely of children. Good morning, class. Good morning, teacher. How are you? Fine, thank you. You are fine, thank you. What is this one, Ise? Ise? Yes. Aside from their enthusiasm to learn English, these children have one thing in common. They are all orphans. Very good. How are you today? And this is the man they call father. Okay. You. Are they doing good, Thomas? Yako Burger is a white Afrikaans. He takes a very special interest in the children's education. The school is an extension of an orphanage which Yako founded 13 years ago. Uh, when I get to villages, I couldn't handle that children get treated badly. In some cases, you can't do anything about it. But I decide I want to do my little bit for the Himba tribe and for the Himba people and the Himba community uh, to start a, a place where the children can be safe. Bye bye, class. Bye bye, teacher. Bye bye, class. Bye bye, teacher. Yako built the orphanage because this generation of desert children may never know what it is to have a traditional family. It's predicted that within 10 years, one in four children in Namibia will be orphaned by AIDS. Yako's partner at the orphanage is his wife and tribal queen, Mukayo. They work together to provide a long-term shelter for every growing child. 
Hupo is one of the boys we have here and his parents uh, were both HIV positive and that's how Hupo actually ended with us on the end of the day. He was two months old when he get him but also we have tested him and uh, he was very very lucky not to be positive. The son of a white farmer, Yako spent much of his youth playing with Himba children and he learned the language. He became accepted as a true member of the tribe and spotting an opportunity to help the locals make money, he began to bring tourists to the village. When Mukayo married Yako, she was 40 and already married to another man. As tribal queen, it was hoped that she would be a natural leader and produce many children to continue the ancestral line. Then sadly, Mukayo discovered she was unable to have children. But in marrying Yako, she had found a kindred spirit who would help her fulfill her maternal instincts. We love people and to be together with many people and to help other people was the reason why we started to search for children and for other people to, to living together with us. This seed of an idea grew into the orphanage that is now home to 43 children. As well as providing an alternative family for Yako and Mukayo, the orphanage fulfills the critical role of providing a safe haven for children orphaned by AIDS. Part of Yako and Mukayo's vision is that the children here will learn to respect their ancient traditions as well as master new skills. Okay, this is my. This is my. In other desert villages, education is not available to all. This is my ass, okay, this is my. So these orphans are being given a very special start in life. We give opportunity here to, to live the traditional way, but also to know about the Western world, the outside world there, but, and to combine the two worlds for them together. And we are trying our best, and so far it's really successful. The orphanage is proof that the will of a few can change the lives of many, and that the future of the Nami is in everyone's hands. Today, while many of Namibia's children still grow up in the desert, many more are living increasingly urban lives in towns and cities on the edges of the wilderness. How are you? Are you ready for the day? Morning, morning. My name is Tommy. Morning. Welcome aboard. This is my son TJ. He's going to accompany us today. The fastest growth has been in the Orongo region, where the population has doubled to 45,000 in just 20 years. Many of Orongo's children would never venture into the desert, were it not for the efforts of people like Tommy Collard, a local wildlife expert who is determined to educate them about life beneath the sand. Today, Tommy is taking these teenagers into the desert for a wilderness lesson they'll never forget. I have a very large office. This is my office, you see? We live in an electronic age nowadays. And uh, they actually make a joke that uh, children are born with thick thumbs, you know, to play PlayStations. And if we do not expose them to this type of environment and the importance of it. The, the day when they have the opportunity to sit in the chair and make decisions, this will not be important for them. And that's why the education of kids is the tip of my heart.
so he squirts for me. Ever since he was small, Tommy has been obsessed with Namibia's flora and fauna. Look at that, man. This is a dollar bush. Water. Lots of water. But it's the little critters that intrigue Tommy the most. Tommy has spent so many years seeking out the weird and wonderful, he's developed a taste for the extraordinary. While Tommy knows how to put on a show, he also knows the life cycle of this desert like no one else. Though they look arid and lifeless, these dunes are home to a unique ecosystem. Across the Namib, mists and fogs frequently roll in off the ocean. On plants, rocks and dunes, this moisture-rich air condenses into water droplets. Every surface becomes a micro-oasis for incredible desert creatures like the Palmato gecko. They have beautiful eyes, but they can't blink the eyes, so they have a long tongue and they lick the eyes. They have feet like a duck, but there's no water here. In sharing his precious knowledge, Tommy is hoping to enthuse the next generation about preserving the desert's most elusive little wonders. Of the mouth. They have an opening. Check him out. I used to think when I come here, the dunes, I thought, I would just run into the snake any time. But now I saw the bushman, I can see where the snake is, whether there is a snake or not. OK, can you see the black tip of the tail? Yeah. They drink water with it. This was very exciting and very fun. I thought, like, animals are harmful and stuff, but then the way you treat them will be the way they will treat you. And if you have respect for animals and you treat them with feeling, Everything's fine. When they take a chameleon, to them it's witchcraft. They are terrified of chameleons. Just to take it like that and you, you see the light come on, then this whole morning trip was with it. When the other school children have left, one lucky teenager stays on for an extra special lesson. Today, Tommy's son, TJ, is learning to drive. It's actually very really nice to feel when the tourists feel it feels like every now and then that somebody else do the driving. Driving through the desert is difficult enough, but when your father is a conservationist, there's more to think about than just steering. We drive on the dunes because if the wind blows, the tracks will be gone. Not like the people that have been driving next to the dune now. Those tracks will never go away. For TJ, it's not just about avoiding an accident. It's about avoiding the wildlife, too. You must teach your eyes just to check the area, look on the road. Check the area, look on the road. The lesson ends on foot, with a feverish hunt for one of the desert's most elusive and venomous creatures. You see here, he makes an imprint. Lost it, lost it, lost it. We know this is quite fresh. This is quite fresh. OK. This little creature is poisonous and fast. This is the track. OK, then this is the track. So he put his foot in there and he dragged it in this direction. Suddenly, he makes his entry. The scorpion, a creature so perfectly adapted to desert conditions, it's been around for hundreds of millions of years. Now you basically get two types of scorpions, ones with thick pinches, thin tails. This guy has got very small pinches, you see that? Mm. So he's got no power there, so the tail is potent. One wrong move now, and Tommy could be stung with the flick of a tail. Even if it can't reach its victim, the scorpion can still spray its poison as far as a meter. The venom is so potent, it could kill a man. 
If you touch it, it squirts out more. One little finger, you see that? The moment you stimulate him there, then he squirts out venom. Even though Tommy's been handling scorpions for years, with this one, he's taking no chances. Now look at that. You see the imprint on my finger? You have to hold him. Yeah. Better like that than him getting hold of you. Tommy hopes that one day TJ will follow in his footsteps and continue the work of preserving the little things that make this desert remarkable. It's not just the little creatures that have evolved to handle desert conditions. So too have the biggest, most magnificent beasts of all. The Namib is one of only two places in the world where desert elephants survive in the wild. Over millennia, they have adapted to life in this arid expanse, developing unique survival skills, the greatest of which is their seemingly uncanny ability to find water. It's a skill that's vital to their survival. Even desert elephants need to drink up to 50 gallons of water a day. They do it through a combination of intelligence and super sensitive hearing. The mother elephants can memorize every waterhole across at least 11,000 square kilometers even those they've only drunk from once. What's more, they can hear the sound of rainfall across great distances and lead the herd towards it. In the past, at the height of the dry season, humans searching for water knew their best bet was to follow the elephants. Using this knowledge, the indigenous Herero tribe were able to farm the desert raising cattle and goats. But in the 19th century, they faced brutal competition for the desert's resources. In the mid-1850s, German colonists began to settle across Namibia. They seized the Herero's lands and handed them over to white farmers. Then in 1904, Germany launched a deliberate policy of genocide. Thousands of Herero men, women and children were massacred. Those that survived were sent to concentration camps where they were denied proper food and shelter and used as slave labor. Of the 80,000 Herero who previously lived here, only 15,000 survived. In the desert region of Kunene, just over 100 kilometers from where the Germans committed genocide, lies a tiny tribal settlement near Okambe Odombo. Here, some Herero still live and raise cattle. The stone buildings in which they shelter are a stark contrast to the traditional mud houses of the Himba and a testament to the influence of the European colonists. So too are the Victorian-style garments proudly worn by Herero women. Despite the desert heat, cattle farmer Ella Chivese wears a handmade dress and a different one every day. In the 1850s, the European colonists employed Herero women as domestic servants. To save their embarrassment at having to look at the Herero's exposed bodies, the Germans gave the tribal women modest European dresses and insisted they cover up. 
Their headpiece comes from an earlier tradition. It symbolizes the horns of their beloved cattle. Though a little unsuitable for desert life, it's a costume that has stood the test of time. Proudly worn as a mark of tribal identity, it takes up to nine meters of fabric to make each dress. The Herrera women have also turned their fashion into a tidy business, selling handmade dolls to tourists. But the main source of income is cattle farming. Today, Ella's husband, Festus, is collecting water for his livestock. It's a task he has attended to every day of his life. But lately, there seems to be less water to go around. And Festus is finding that he has some competition. In the past, villagers lived peacefully alongside the giants of the desert. But today, this symbiotic relationship has disintegrated into violence. Since the 1900s, poaching and hunting has decimated and displaced the elephant population. In turn, the animals are responding with aggression. In the past six years, two people have been killed locally by marauding elephants. As the attacks become more frequent, the locals are becoming increasingly anxious. And the ancestral knowledge of how to live peacefully with these great beasts is disappearing. One woman dedicated to restoring this delicate balance between man and beast is Dr. Betsy Fox. Good morning, all, and welcome. Having lived in Namibia for the past 22 years, Dr. Fox now works for an elephant conservation volunteer group based in the region. The organization wants to explode the myths about the dangers that elephants pose to humans. We are amazed at how much they actually don't know about elephants. They think if an elephant comes to your house, it's gonna kill you. It creates a lot of fear among the people, and they will retaliate against the elephants if they do come to their house by shooting them sometimes. Um, most people luckily do not, but that does happen. Some of the fears have a basis in fact. Herrero have witnessed an elephant killing their livestock, and stories of humans being attacked are commonplace. But in most cases, the elephants are simply defending their herds and water holes. Today, Dr. Fox and her colleagues have persuaded these locals to come on a special safari to face their fears and experience the thrill of seeing elephants in the wild. And if we can take them out to the field and they can see the elephants firsthand and see that they're not gonna hurt them, they're not gonna do anything to them, that then that really decreases their fear, changes their attitudes. That's what we're looking for. Okay, let's find these elephants. Okay. <laughs> So we're having some tracks which are a little bit older. The elephants are at that hill there. 
With 16 years experience in elephant tracking, Hendrik Munembome knows how to stay close to the herd. So it's time for binoculars. Without scaring the animals. We are no more far from the elephant. I think about um, 600 meters. So then we see what is the best way to possess ourselves so that we cannot bother them and have enough time to enjoy them. Then, in one magical moment, all preconceptions are swept aside. This is the closest the group has ever been to elephants in the wild. It's precisely the outcome Betsy and her team have been hoping for. A life-changing day for the locals. The elephants don't seem to care at all. For some, the fear is so deeply ingrained that it may take more than one visit to build trust. Oh, <laughs> The safaris are small scale, but Dr. Fox and her team are making a real difference, arresting the decline of ancient knowledge and protecting not only the future of the elephants, but also of the desert itself. If they were to disappear, it might cause a cascade effect of lots of other species dying out, not just animals, but plants, because Elephants do a lot of good for their environment. Tamba. I cannot think of anything I would rather do in my life. <laughs> so I hope I can do it for many years to come. The desert is not just a beautifully balanced ecosystem. It is also a place of great, subterranean wealth, where minerals have accumulated and remained buried for millennia. Ten percent of all the world's uranium lies beneath the vast expanses of the Namib. The arid landscape also conceals more beautiful treasures, diamonds, precious stones and crystals, which for generations people have prospected, often with their bare hands. Though the chances of striking it rich are slim, the addiction of mining the desert is strong. In the northern reaches of the Namib, the Brandberg mountain region is a geological wonderland. Famous for the color of its rock face at sunset, Brandberg means fire mountain in German. Rising 2,600 meters, it is Namibia's highest peak. It towers over the country's largest deposit of semi-precious stones and gems that have been almost 140 million years in the making. In the shadow of the mountain, on the remote and rocky plains, there are five miners who are proud to call this place home. For 21 years, Russ Grief and his family have built up a small but profitable business, prospecting gemstones to sell overseas. 
The key to their success lies in a simple but effective formula, keeping it small and keeping it in the family. The griefs are almost entirely self-sufficient and they embrace the isolation. The biggest challenge is the lack of water. It hasn't rained on the homestead for two years and everyone's supply is rationed. The secret to survival is a careful division of labor. During the week, one of Marta's tasks is to educate her son. And it's not just the potential expense of sending him away to boarding school that motivates her. Meanwhile, outside in the dusty quarry, the compressor splutters to life. Ras and his oldest son Vince are getting a head start on a hot day of mining. They use gunpowder to blast rocks, hoping to reveal the gems inside. In total, the Graf family has a license for nine separate claims. They mine them scrupulously, one small patch at a time. It's an industrial process, but by doing it on a small scale, the environmental impact is limited they almost always unearth chunks of crystal. And sometimes they find something extra special. Unusual, colorful, or large crystals are the most attractive to collectors. And Ras can't mine fast enough to keep up with demand. The growth of this crystal in the fact that they have a metric stand the family has also invested in specialist machinery, so Marta and daughter Ella can clean and polish the smaller gems. Om klippen te processeer, die manier wat ons te doen, voeg ons waarde toe. Ons geef waarde in ons zit een beetje liefde in energie en wat ons doen. Dan krijgen ons meer waarde voor ons voor ons producten. The women scrub up the spoils of the men's latest efforts. Nothing goes to waste. Shattered pieces of rock and shards of crystal are molded into decorative pieces just in case a passing tourist comes looking to buy. As soon as the sun goes down, Ras and the family get busy with an important evening routine. They're on the lookout for a particularly unwelcome house guest who likes to visit at night. Though difficult to see in the dark, Scorpion's exoskeletons glow a brilliant blue-green when subjected to an ultraviolet lamp. Scientists are still unsure why this happens, but this family appreciates the warning. I can't precisely tell how many times, but it's definitely over 100 times what they have already stuck. But the first thing is, if you have a big pair of boots, you can stick them. If you have three days, you can stick them. Yeah, it's like that. To end the day, 
it's barbecue time. Desert style. It might be a simple existence, but Ras is convinced that with the right marketing and a bit of money, he and his family have a unique desert experience to offer the tourists. Oneindige potentiaal wat die is. Die is als vier verschillende ecologische stelsels wat bij elkaar komen. Die mineralen, die zo, die brandberg, oegaprofier, voor die renosters, die olifanten, alles, alle, alles is die zo. So many of the people who've made their home in the oldest desert on earth share the same passion, to work together to preserve the pristine nature of the Namib. This ancient wilderness of sand and hill thrills every new visitor. Those who have the privilege come to see that life here is more than a safari. Every generation born here needs to learn how to refresh the balance of life between the desert and its creatures. Even in its harshest corners and under the terrible shadow of disease, the strength of family endures. And the dunes themselves provide precious lessons on how to survive and thrive. Namib Desert, the dance of life goes on. Yeah.